Hello, my name is Roland Dugard, and this is my capstone project for the DocuSign CLM Implementation Consultant Accreditation Program. Before I get started, I want to go ahead and read the use case for this project. XYZ Corp wants to streamline their process for creating and handling vendor procurement agreements. An XYZ Corp sales representative should be able to generate a vendor contract in CLM using a standard template with a document generation form. They should also be able to upload a third party vendor agreement using a document generation form. The document generation form should capture relevant vendor information that will either be merged into the standard template, stored in attribute fields, or used for workflow variables. Vendors are not tracked in Salesforce, so XYZ Corp needs, to, needs a process that allows a user to select from a list of approved vendors or add a new vendor. The user should be able to maintain this vendor list in the CLM environment if new vendors should be added. The generated or uploaded vendor contract should be stored in the CLM environment while leveraging a folder structure. Attributes should be automatically applied to the contract for searchability and reportability. As far as the solution design goes, a workflow solution will need to be created. The standard template agreements will be routed for legal review. Legal will have the ability to redline the document and have a choice to either send the document to the vendor for their review, send the document to an internal user for their review, send the document to DocuSign eSignature, or reject the document and thus end the workflow. If the vendor or internal user is sent, is sent the document for the review, upon completion of their review, the document is routed back to legal. Third-party vendor agreements will need to be routed to the sales representative's manager for approval before being routed to legal. Once legal determines the document is ready for e-signature, the document will be sent to both the internal and external signatories for their e-signature or for their signature. Upon completion of the DocuSign signature process, the signed document is stored in CLM with the captured signed date. Documents that are not signed should be accounted for with a workflow exception path. Workflow should be, crea workflow should be created using DocuSign CLM best practices and designed for future updates by XYZ Corp administrators. XYZ Corp must be able to report on how long it takes for the contract review workflow to be completed on average. They must also be able to report on the contracts currently under review, as well as the stage in the review process for each of the contracts. In addition, XYZ Corp will need to report on the various attribute fields assigned to each contract. Okay, so we've just read through um, the general workflow here, or the general assignment. And now I will take you through the process um, as a user of DocuSign CLM. So what you can see on my screen here, and let me just make sure that I am sharing correctly. Okay. Okay, so right now we are in logged into DocuSign CLM and we are acting as the sales representative or the contract requester, whoever is going to be um, requesting this contract be generated. So right now we are on my main dashboard. Here you can see a few different widgets, but we'll get into those at the end of this, pre towards the end of this presentation. But a quick overview is here I can see all of my tasks. Over to the right, I'll see my recently accessed documents. Down below, I get a snapshot of the folder structure that I'll be working in. And then on the right here, an overview of one of the reports that we use, which shows the different statuses of contracts that, are, um, that have gone through this workflow. So that's just a quick visual. This dashboard is, is meant to serve as an overview before you get into the, the nitty gritty details of any of these tabs. Okay, so to generate a contract, I'm going to go up here to actions and then scroll down 
And this is a shared environment with the rest of my company, Spalding Ridge. And so you will see other, um, other capstones in here as well. However, right here, I'll click on mine, generate contract for our do guard. And the name here can be changed. And it will bring me to this page where now it is asking the sales representative or requester whether they would like to use a third party upload or a standard template. For this first round, we'll go ahead and use the standard template. It brings you to this next page where you have an abundance of fields that the sales representative will be asked to fill in. So I have pre-populated these fields with information um, just to make the demo go smoother. But as you can see, these are all editable and in real life, you could decide, okay, whether or not you would want some of this information pre-filled or if you would want it to be filled in new from blank by the sales representative each time. So I'll just fill in some of this custom information just to show you the functionality of it. So I've changed the project name to DocuSign CLM Capstone. I can change the department. Um, I'll just say compliance here. The contract amount is now a million dollars. And then the payment terms. Let's say that I want to change this net 30, no, um, maybe other. This will show you a conditional field. Here, now when I click on other, all of a sudden, this other payment terms box fills or opens up and now I have to fill that out. So I might say here, net 365, give me a whole year, okay? And then we'll go down to the vendor selection. Here we have a list of existing vendors. So if we do this drop down, it'll show us the existing vendors that are already approved as well as if we don't see what we want, um, the company that the vendor that we want to use here, you can also go to new vendor and add a new vendor name. So let's say right now I want to use Spalding Ridge, but Spalding Ridge is not listed here. Well, I would go to new vendor and I can go ahead and type in Spalding Ridge right there and that will be the vendor name for this contract. Again, vendor address information. I've pre-populated this information just to make this demonstration go smoother, but you can of course change any of this information. So I can go ahead and change that out. 456 Test Street, we'll say that this is in San Francisco. State will say the same, but you do have the list of all the states here. And then zip code, region, North America. And then we have some contact information as well. Here is where I would add in the information for the vendor. So for Spalding Ridge, if I know that I have an external signatory or an external contract or contact, excuse me, I would enter their name here, their title here, and um, their email address. Obviously, I'm just I'll be acting as all of the people in this demonstration. So what I've done here is just use a fake name, fake title, and then just um, an email address as well that will be routed back to, to my own and I'll show you how that all works. And then again here for XYZ Corp information, so now this is internal information, I've, we're asking for the XYZ signatory name. Um, so who will actually have to sign this from XYZ? their title as well, and then the email. Again, using my email address here for the sake of this demonstration. Once you see that all of your information is filled out, oh, and then of course the expiration dates here. So again, what I've done here is preset them. Um, once again, just for the sake of this demonstration, I have the effective date automatically set to the date of creation on this um, of this document, and then the expiration date uh, set to the end of the month. Of course, you can leave those blank. You can set them up differently. And I, again, we'll show how that's all done later on in this presentation. All right, so we have all of our information here. We'll go on to the next page.
and it will build our document preview. Okay. Now we see the document preview. So here's our cover page. We see DocuSign CLM Capstone. That was the project name that we put in. This is a master services agreement between XYZ Corp, the internal company that I'm acting in, and then Spalding Ridge, the vendor that we identified, the new vendor that we identified. As well, we have the internal signatory. So who will actually be signing off on this project is what I was trying to get across here. So that would be Roland Dugard, which we listed as the internal XYZ signatory. And then who will be signing off for the vendor? And we said that that would be Katie Weeks as the external signatory, okay? So scrolling down now, we can actually see the information has been populated. So we have the effective date here. We have the vendor that was populated, Spalding Ridge. And then the address, so 456 Test Street, San Francisco. Remember, we changed that from Yuba City to San Francisco, California, 95616. So that information has all been pre-populated or populated from the back from the form. And going all the way to the bottom, we see that the name has been changed here, right, for the vendor so that they will be able to sign here and XYZ Corporation will sign here. Now let's say I'm going back up here and I'm looking at this information and I realize, oh, you know what, actually, this is the wrong zip code. I need to change that. Well, we're still just in the preview. So we can go back and I see this um, go down to the vendor address information and I see the zip code is wrong. And I'll just go ahead and change that to the correct zip code. And now it will build a preview for us again. All right. So now when we scroll down, we see, okay, phew, there's the correct zip code. And now we're good to go ahead and save that document. All right, the document has been gener generated. This window will automatically close once it's saved. And now it has taken us to our documents tab. So if you remember when we were on the dashboard here, we clicked on actions to generate the contract. If we were to click on the documents tab here, it would take us to that same page that we were just on. It might just be faster just to stay here. All right, so now we're on the documents tab. So from the documents tab, we're going to navigate to our specific capstone. So for me, again, this is a shared environment with the rest of my company. My entire capstone project is within this folder, Dugard capstone. So that's what we'll be working out of. Now, where did that contract that we just generated go? It went to our contract repository. So we'll click into our contract repository. And if you remember from the form, we had selected the compliance department that this would go under. So we'll click on compliance. And then the vendor name. So we're looking for Spalding Ridge. And now we see an in process folder. So the description here is pretty much tells it all. These are contracts that are still in progress, meaning that these contracts have not been fully signed. They're not completed and that they aren't uh, rejected, a rejected contract, okay? So as we go through this process, you will see that other folders, depending on where the um, document is sent, will be created and, the, and accordingly, the document will be moved to those folders based on its status. So for now, we're on the in process folder. And here we have the document that we just created. So you see that the name has been automatically created. Spalding Ridge, the vendor, DocuSign CLM Capstone, that's the project name, and then 24 March 2021, the effective date. So all of the um, documents that we create in this, in this demonstration will follow the same naming convention. 
it will go by vendor name underscore project name underscore effective date. And we'll see that as well. And then here we see a, a quick description. Okay, what is the status of, of this document right now? Okay, right now it's pending legal approval and we'll get to that next. But first I wanna show you some details about the actual document. So if we click into the document, we'll get to see that document preview again. I'll just give it a second to load here. All right, so now we see that same document that we just created, the DocuSign CLM capstone, master services agreement between XYZ Corp and Spalding Ridge. And you scroll down and you can see the whole, the whole document again, all right? And now going over to the left tab here, I will show you that we have some document information. So we have the name and we have the description, which like we just saw before on the last page, right here, pending legal approval. So it's pending legal approval. Now, if we go down to the attributes, we'll see that attributes have been automatically applied to this document. So some of them here are the effective date, project name, the vendor name, some address information, the internal owner, as well as the external contact and their um, email, respective email addresses. We see that the contract status is pending legal approval. We see that the contract amount is $1 million. We see that the payment terms that were selected were other, which requires additional information, and that the user entered net 365, and that the department is compliance. Now, right now, we see that some of these fields are editable. So if I wanted to go ahead and say, oh, that wasn't supposed to be for compliance, it was supposed to be for finance, or if I was supposed to say, oh, this wasn't supposed to be a million dollars, this was just supposed to be you know, $1,000, um, we could change those contract amounts. Uh, so alternatively though, we see that we cannot change the address information or the vendor name after the document has been created. Now this will be up to the actual company, the administrator, whoever will be running this, whether or not they want these different fields to be required, or sorry, not required, but editable. Um, but they can also decide whether they will be required as well. And so when we go into the back end and show how, how attribute groups are applied, attributes and attribute groups are applied, I will show you how you can make those changes. But I've shown you a mix of both, um, both editable and um, non-editable fields right now, and those can be changed. All right, so now we're gonna go back here, and now we're going to navigate from Documents tab, we're gonna go over to our Tasks tab. Okay, so right now, I am acting as the legal team. If you remember from the uh, use case description, what has to happen if, what happens is that for a standard template, the document is routed to legal where the legal will have a decision to make. So I've named this task legal decision hub. You can rename that as, as you like, and we'll show you how to do that as well. And I'm gonna click on that. I'm now acting as someone from the legal team. And now I will have, we're looking at that same document again. So instead of from info, attributes, now we just went down to tasks, okay? So similarly, if we're, from the previous page that we were in, we could have just gone straight to tasks as well, but I wanted to show you the process of checking your tasks from the task tab, especially because in, real, in a real use, it wouldn't be the same user who, who necessarily has all of the same tasks lined up. So since I am part of the legal team right now, I see this, I click on my, my, um, my task, and it will bring me here. I have an option. Now, as we discussed, there are several options for the legal team to make here. They can choose to redline or edit the document. They can decide that the document requires additional approval um, internally, and we'll send that out for review. And then they can send it externally for vendor review or they can send it for signature by both parties. And then lastly here, they can reject the document, which will cancel the workflow altogether. 
So the first thing that we're going to do is go ahead and show you what it would be to edit the document. So let's say that, okay, I'm legal and I've decided that there needs to be some changes to this document. I will select redline document, next. Okay, now that that has been loaded, now we're back to the tasks again. Now this task of redlining is again assigned to the legal team. So it brings us here, and now we see that our task is to redline that document. All right, so now we are given the opportunity to edit this document. Now, there are several different ways that you can edit a document. The one that I will show you right now is probably going to be the, is the most often used. And I will also show the best practices for doing so. So first of all, before we, before we um, start editing a document, we want to check it out first. So we'll go to more in the top right, check in and out, and then select check out. Now, what this does is it locks the document so that nobody else can make edits while you are doing, making edits. Um, the purpose for this is so that you don't end up having multiple versions of the document existing um, when you really just want one source of truth. So this allows me to check out the document, make any edits I have, no one else can touch it until I check it back in, and then they will see the document as, um, as I have edited it, edited it. So now that the document is checked out, I'm going to download the file. Okay. And I will show you now, I'm looking at it. All right, let's see. And I realize that we need to add another section, right? So just to give you an example, Okay, so we'll pretend that this is a full um, legal clause here. And right now, that's what we're just gonna put in, okay? So I've edited the document and now has all the information that I believe it should have. I can go ahead, save here, close it out. And now I will select check in and out, check in. And now I can go ahead and find that document, drag it back in here, make any comments. I added a section and save. All right, so now the document has been checked back in. If we scroll down, we'll see that part that was added. But let's say somebody else is looking at this document, all right, and they pull it up, they'll see this, they'll see this same page. Now they might not have the same tasks, but if they pull up this document, they will see that they can compare with another version. Now this tells them that, okay, a change has been made. Should they want to compare with the old version, they can click the checkbox here 
And CLM will automatically compare the two documents and show you the red lines, um, similar to tracked changes in Word document, will show you where edits have been made to the document. Okay, so now it's loaded again. We're doing compare. We'll scroll down to the bottom. All right, and now we see, oh, okay. It has this bar on the left-hand side to show us, okay, an edit has been made. And then furthermore, it actually goes ahead and um, puts that text in red so that it's easier to see. Similarly, if I were to delete a section, it would show that it's crossed out in red as well, so that you can easily identify what changes have been made to the document. Okay, so now that we've made our edits, we'll go back to our tasks. Let me close this out and just refresh our tasks here. Okay. And you know what? I actually forgot to complete this task by putting in, um, well, here we don't have comments required, right? But you can make them required if you want to. Here, I'm just going to comment so that we can go ahead and see where these comments are kept, right? So I just made those red lines. Um, and we'll go ahead and say, I added a section at the very end. That's my comment and I can click next. And now that I have completed those edits, as, again, I'm still acting as a member of the legal team here. We will be returned back to the legal, um, the legal choice hub. The, so that same task that we talked about before where you have all those choices of whether to send it for internal or external review, signature, make edits or cancel the document. Okay, so now that that is completed, we see we're back here at our tasks tab. Again, we're still acting as a member of this legal team. And now when we open it back up, we'll see that we have those same options again that we first started with. So we have the, these options here. And okay, our next step, we're gonna say, all right, we've already redlined the document. This time we want to send it for additional internal review. So I'll say this needs additional internal review. And if we go back to now, if we look at the activity tab on the left here, we'll see that there was a legal review. And if we click on this little um, speech bubble, it'll show my comment from the last part. I added a section at the very end. So anybody that touches this document throughout the workflow can go to this activity tab and quickly see, okay, kind of what are the major steps that happened and what were any comments that people made? If you would like to see a more detailed history, you can go to more, click on history here, and it will show you a much more detailed history of the document. So going back to my tasks, we're saying it requires additional internal review, and we'll click next. Now the next step here is going to be for the legal user or whoever just decided that it needs additional internal review. They will now be asked to choose who that user or users uh, who that user is or who those users are. Okay. So now we've been asked, we have another task, select additional internal reviewers. So I'm gonna click on that task And now it'll allow me to select, select um, an additional reviewer. Now, right now, for the sake of for the sake of this um, demonstration, I'm going to choose myself so that I can continue to push this workflow forward. 
So I can search here. And it will show the users. I'm just going to select myself here, our do guard. Please review ASAP. And then we can go ahead and now that that user is selected, they will be assigned a task of reviewing it. Okay, so I'll refresh here. And I go under my tasks now, and it's showing me that I need an additional internal review. So I can click on this. And actually one thing I do wanna show before I forget is that for each step, users will also get an email notification and that has been set up through the workflow as well. So just to give you an example here, I'll pull up mine here. We just got this email address, which includes the branding. Okay, the contract for Spalding Ridge requires your attention. Please check your tasks tab in DocuSign CLM or click below to view and complete your assigned task. So before I was just refreshing the, um, refreshing the tasks tab so that my task would show up. That's because I am the same user playing as all of these different actors. However, if you were sending it to a different user, you would, they would receive an email like this and they could either go to their tasks tab and it would show up for them or they can click here. And it will open that right up. Okay, so now we see that same the same task that we saw before, but we went through it through the email. All right, so now as an internal another internal reviewer, I do have the option um, to approve or reject this document, and it does have some instructions here. If approving the document, please enter initials into comment box. If rejecting, please enter reasoning into comments box. So those are custom instructions that you can set um, within the workflow, which we will also show, but that's how it will look for the end user. They'll see those instructions there. They see the document. And one thing that I also wanna highlight as we go through this is that as we go through each step, the information and the, um, the information for the document and its attributes, as well as the general information is being updated. So if you remember before, it said that uh, we had we were pending legal review. Now we see that we are pending additional internal review. So that shows you what step you are in, as well as if we look at the attributes here, we'll see that the contract status is now been changed to pending additional internal review. So that's done automatically as it goes from step to step. One thing that I didn't mention before, the sign date here is empty, obviously because the document has not been signed. However, at the end, we will show you that the sign date does get automatically filled in once all parties have signed the document. So I'm gonna go back to my tasks here. And let's say I take a look at this document. All right, looks good to me. So I'm gonna approve this and I'll say, Okay, the instruction said, if I'm approving, just put my initials. Okay, so I'll just put my initials there and I can complete my task. Now that that task is completed, if we think back to the, um, to the actual use case and description, after each review is completed, it will be routed back to the legal team. So if I, to show you guys again here, now I got another email. Now this is going to the legal, um, the legal team and it shows us that, okay, everybody in the legal team will get the same email. Now someone can click here and it will take us to our tasks again. Alternatively, again, if you were on the tasks and you just refresh the page, it will show you that the legal team has a new task. So here we'll show you that the legal team has a new task and you'd have to click on it. 
if you click on it from the email, it'll take you straight to that task, okay? So from here, the legal team, again, has that same choice. We're back at that choice hub. So we redlined the document, we send it out for additional, inter additional internal review. And let's say, all right, I think it's ready for the vendor to take a look at this. And just saying again, the information now shows that the additional internal review is complete. Again, that's reflected in the attributes as well. The additional internal review is complete. So again, highlighting that this contract status will change as it moves through each step of the workflow. So back to the task here. All right, so now we're saying that it's ready for vendor review. Okay, we'll select that. And I'll say, please review, or actually this will be an internal comment. So we'll say sending for external review first time. Again, activity here, we see the activity has been updated, right? So now we see all the different comments that were added here. And then as well, we see that it tells you what user has done it. In this case, it's always going to be me. So back to the tasks, we're sending it for vendor review, sending it for external review. We'll click next here. And now, what the system is going to do is it's going to pull that external contact information that we had in the original document generation form and identify the email address from it. And it will then go ahead and send this document to that email address so that he or she can um, complete the, the vendor review or the external review, however you want to call it. Add one thing here. So once we've selected that it will be going for vendor review, we have one more task here, which allows us um, to go ahead and review it before it finally gets sent out. So we identified that we do wanna send it for external review. Um, one part that I forgot to add, this will be an additional step, <coughs> is that, okay, like I said, the system is now pulling that email address. If you remember this email address from the document generation form, if we realize that it is incorrect, we can go ahead and change that now. We can select if we need anybody else to be notified. If any ad additional documents need to be sent along with this one. And then again, we have a subject and a message for that email. These have been automatically set through the workflow. However, you do have the opportunity to change them here if you realize that, okay, um, it's missing some information or you just want to change it for a different reason. We can set a due date for the, um, for the action for, from the external reviewer. And then we have some additional options here for branding, um, appearance, and those kinds of things. Okay, so again, back up here, now we will actually be sending that document to the external reviewer. Okay, and close some of these tabs. Now you'll see that we have zero tasks here. Even if we were to refresh, there are no tasks because right now the only task is for the external reviewer. So this workflow will be paused or waiting until the external reviewer either finishes their review or the, their time expires. So going back to my email here, now we see that this email was sent to rduguard plus katieweeks at spaldingridge.com. So that was the external email address that we had, um, that we identified. And then here we'll see Hello, Katie Weeks. Again, that's the name of the, of the um, vendor contact that we had. Please follow the link to review the pending contract with XYZ Corp. Thanks from Roland. All right, so now it references the document that's, that we're going to be using. And then if we click review again, now this 
Katie Weeks individual will be taken to her opportunity to review. All right, so it comes with some instructions here and you can either download to make any changes or, um, or, or you can go ahead and say that you don't need to make any changes. So just for the sake of showing every possible way to do this, we'll go ahead and open it. here and now I am the external um, external reviewer. I am the vendor right now taking a look at this document and seeing if any changes need to be made. Okay, let's see, I'm looking at this. Okay. And let's say, all right, proprietary rights, uh, I don't like that section. So I'm just going to delete it. Okay, I don't want that section anymore. So I'll save and I will close this document. And now we can go to the next step, select a file. We have that same one right here. Next. And I'll say deleted a section that, that we do not agree to. And notice I'm not really specifying what section that is. So I'm gonna complete here. And now the external review is complete. And now we'll get another email notification back to the, um, the sales representative or requester that our external reviewer, Katie Weeks, has completed that, completed that review. We see her comment here, deleted a section that we do not agree to. And then if I wanna you know, view that, and now we see it's been updated to version three now, because now we've made edits first at the legal red lines, and now at the external review stage, you can see that as well. And then here, this is the email that would go to the external reviewer. So this is to Katie Weeks, telling her that her review is complete. And then it gives her a summary again of the comments that she made, as well as if she wants to view the document, she can click on here and it will take her back to that document view. And now I have another task assignment email. So now this comes back to me. This is this would be an email to the legal department. And now it's saying, okay, again, you have a task. So, so I can click here. I'll just move this over. And now that the external review has been completed, we find ourselves again at the legal choice hub. So from here, let's pull it over here. Now we have those same options again. So we sent it for red, redlining the document. We made those changes. We sent it for additional internal review, got it back. We sent it for vendor review um, and then just got it back again. And now we have two more choices. So a couple things that I wanna point out here before we move on. First of all, the attributes. So the attributes have now been changed. Again, external review is complete. Similarly, the info shows external review is complete. I just wanna show you guys again, or show you all again. Now, if we go back to the documents tab, it will also show that here, that information at a glance. External review is complete for this document. And, okay. So going back to our tasks, and then the other thing was, okay, we know changes have been made, right? So now it says compare with version two, not version one. Well, let's say that we wanted to compare it with version one. We click here and select version one instead and now it will show us all changes, just like we showed before, between um, this current version and version one. Okay. 
So now we're comparing with that original version of the document. So here now we will see, okay, proprietary rights. We see, wow, okay, the external vendor or the external reviewer, the vendor, deleted this entire section. We'll also see, because we're comparing to the original version, that this part, this section was, was added. Now, if we had just been comparing back to version two, we wouldn't see this. Uh, we wouldn't see this here because that was already existing in version two. But we would only see this part. All right. So after seeing those um, those changes, legal now has a choice again, like we said, to do any of these things. They could say, okay, those changes are not good. I need to redline this document again and make some changes. And then from there, they could decide to send it for internal review again, send it for vendor review again. And that process can continue indefinitely until all parties are happy with the document. However, let's just say for the sake of this demonstration that they are fine with the document as is. And so now they're ready to send it for signature. All right. I'll add in some comments there about kind of why I'm sending it for signature. I, I, I think the edits are fine and I think it's ready for signature. So I'll put that in there and I'll click next. Okay, and now, just like the review um, before sending it for external review, we get this additional step here, review and send for signature. So when you decide to send for um, external review, and, or if you send decide to send for a signature, it's not going to happen instantly. It's going to give you an extra step here so that you get a chance to look over the document again and make sure that everything is right before it gets sent out. And that's what I had forgotten to mention earlier. So now that we are here, again, I'm still acting as someone from the legal team. And again, I'm going to explain what that means later um, in terms of just the legal, the, the task group that is the legal team. So here, again, I have a task now and the task is to send for signature. I can take a look at it and I can either send for signature or I can reject the request to send for signature. I'm going to send for signature. Um, and again, so the status right now is external reviews complete and it's getting ready to be sent for signature and we'll see if that status change. But I'm going to send it for signature, but just to let you know, if we say reject the request, then all that will happen is that this document gets bounced back to the previous step where the legal team has those, those, that array of choices that we discussed. So then they'll have the option to, you know, redline it, to send it for internal review, uh, to send it for external review, or to even say, hey, no, send it for a signature and send it again with, for signature. Um, and we can see the comments here, right? So edits are fine ready for a signature. Okay. Sounds good to me. I'm going to go back here to my tasks and I'm going to send for signature. Okay. So now we are in the send for signature stage. And just a few things that I want to point out here. Here we have the actual document. You can view the document, you can add additional documents. Um, but for right now, we're just going to use that one document that we have. So if you had any auxiliary materials that needed to be included, you could add them here. As well, we have our signees. So these two have been automatically pulled in from the workflow. And if you remember, if you remember back from the original document generation, this Katie Weeks was our um, external signatory. 
and Roland Dugard was our internal signatory. So here we have set the, the signing order so that the vendor signs first, and then the representative from XYZ Corp will sign second. We can also change the options here on whether or not the person needs to sign. And then we can further customize as well with access codes, identi identity verification, et cetera. Um, so, and then, like I said, so these were the two pulled from the document generation form. If you realize that you need to add recipients, you can do that as well. Um, and if, or even if you realize, oh, I shouldn't be the signer here, it should be somebody else, you can change that too. So you can do that for any of these, or if you realize there's errors, but it's pre-populated um, by the system from the information that we originally collected at the document generation form. Similarly, we have an email message. Right now, I just have it set to the email subject being contract between XYZ Corp and Spalding Ridge is ready for signature. And this will change obviously for any different vendor name. And then if you wanted to add an email message as well, you could do that. But the email itself already has um, some information and is pretty straightforward for the, for the um, recipients to follow. So we'll go on to the next, the next step here. And now here is where you would add in your, your various tags within the document to have people sign, um, you know, checkbox, whatever it may be. In our case, we're just looking at signatures, but we'll see here that they have been automatically populated. So now it's split between two pages, um, probably due to these uh, various edits that I've made, but we'll see here that the XYZ Corp already has a Bakker signature, name, title, and date signed. Similarly, Spalding Ridge, the vendor, has um, those different names as well, okay, or those different fields as well. And those are automatically placed there, and we'll show how that's done as well. We can go to the next step to send it, and now it will be sent first to the external signatory, so to Katie Weeks, and then once Katie finishes and signs, it will be sent to me, the uh, secondary signer. So again, we see we have no tasks here. That's because the only task is, um, is outside of CLM right now. So here, I've just gotten, as Katie Weeks, again, the external signatory, has gotten this email address, or this email. And this is what it looks like. So we have the subject line, contract between XYZ Corp and Spalding Ridge ready for signature. And then we have the branding. And here we have the message. So from here, we can go ahead and again, all this is customizable, right? So right now, all it says is this, the, um, the actual document name but we could change that to be more detailed if we wanted. However, it's pretty straightforward once you click on the review document here. The person will be brought to the top of the document and if he, they just they can either scroll down or if they just click start, it'll bring them to that first field that they need to fill in. I'll just wait for this to load. And as you can see, okay, all I have to do is click sign. It already knows that, that signer's name, Katie Weeks. Let's say that it was spelled wrong or something. It was just Katie Weeks. Oh, okay. We, they can change that and it automatically updates. There, the signer can adopt this signature and then it will automatically place that signature right there. Her name automatically placed as well. The date for signature automatically done and then title, we make it this is just a showcase an optional field where the user can either fill it in or leave it empty. Not all of these fields have to be required or automatically filled in. Um, you can set those differently from eSign. Okay, so now we'll finish. And now this user, the external signer is done signing. 
close those out. I'm going to go back to my email and now we've gotten some new emails, right? And one is telling me, me as the internal, internal person to XYZ Corp. So the person who just sent it out for signature, the legal team. Now we are getting an email saying that, um, that Katie, the external signer has viewed that, that contract. So we know that, that, that she has done that. We also now have an email as the secondary signer to do that secondary signature. So similar to that, um, to that other email sent to the external signer, they get the same email for, for the internal signer. And again, the language is customizable. All right, same thing. I'll click start here and it will bring me all the way down to where I need to sign. And here we can see, okay, look, there's already a signature here. Um, that's great. Now I will be the last signer. Already has my name populated as well, Roland Dugard. Roland Dugard here again. Title, optional. Let's put CEO there and we can go ahead and finish this. It'll ask me since I'm already a user, if I wanna log in, I'm gonna say no thanks for this demonstration. And now that will actually wrap up our workflow. So now we've finished that, um, finished that workflow, the document is completed. So now I wanna show you what that looks like from various angles. So first of all, our external signer, Katie Weeks, gets this email address, or this, sorry, this email, notifying her that the, um, that the document has been fully signed. So here, this will be the actual document. And then here will be the certificate. So I'll click that and open it up just so we can show it. But this will be the certificate of completion for the, for the actual contract. And it gives all sorts of, of information um, regarding that document and its history, who the signers are, record tracking, et cetera. So the external signer will receive this email. Similarly, the internal signer will get the same email. So everyone who signed it gets both the signed document as well as the certificate of completion. Finally, we also have an email that automatically gets sent to the salesperson's manager. Now I've just named this Dugard Capstone Manager um, for, for the sake of this. However, the idea is that upon signing, we can trigger an action, right? And that action here is among other things, the manager of the salesperson, the person who is recording this or requesting this, will get an email with that same document as well. So they'll get that actual completed signed document so they can see who the people that they're who the people that they're managing, um, what they're what they're doing and when they are completing tasks. So that will show the manager. Now from the CLM side of things, you can go ahead and refresh this. And whoa, okay, our in process folder is now empty. It says no items. So let's go back to DuGuard Capstone. We'll take it from the top here. Go to our contract repository. We were in compliance, Spalding Ridge. And now you see, now we have a completed folder too. Okay, what's that about? We can, can click this completed folder now. And there is our signed document. And you'll notice that it's a PDF. Once these documents are finalized, they are converted to PDF. The description now says signed. And if we click on that document, we'll see that not only is the description signed here, but in the attributes, 
we'll see that there's a signed date has been updated as well to today's date when it was just signed and the contract status is also changed to signed. Let me scroll down here and we'll let that load. And now we can see both the signatures here and again, status update and the sign date is attribute has also been updated. Okay, we'll close that out. And so we have in process, we have completed. Now there is one other folder that we can show and I'll show that very quickly. So from tasks here, going back to our actions, generate a contract, We'll do a standard template again, and we'll call this, um, we'll just leave that as project X. We'll call this compliance as well. And now what I wanna show you is, remember we put in a new vendor as Spalding Ridge. However, now that we've done that, we can see in our existing vendors, that list has been automatically updated. So now Spalding Ridge, we can just select them easily and go from there. Now, I'm just going to leave this information here so we can skip through it. Because what I'm going to do is show you what happens if we reject, um, reject a contract and thus end the workflow. Oops. Okay, let's try that again. Okay, so now we're back here again. Existing vendor, remember this has been updated to Spalding Ridge now exists as an existing vendor. And then we'll go over to this next page and hopefully it doesn't fail on us. Okay, sorry about that technical difficulty. Now we have finally gotten, there we go. Now we have Project X, Master Services Agreement between XYZ Corp and Spalding Ridge again. And it's the same document, right? Now I'm gonna go ahead and save that. Okay, the document has been saved. Again, this will automatically close out and bring us back here. And now within Again, this folder structure, Dugard Capstone, Contract Repository, Compliance Department, and now the company, Spal the vendor, Spalding Ridge. We have completed, which has our previous contract that we just went through, as well as now we have in process. Oh, excuse me. So <laughs> I forgot to change the department back to compliance. So here we have it in legal now. In legal, now we find our Spalding Ridge folder. Now we have our in process. And now we have that contract that we just, um, that we just created. And again, now it's pending legal approval. So if we click into this, just like before, we see the name is the vendor underscore the project name underscore the effective date. We see the description pending legal approval. We see the attributes again here. 
Now this time we see other payment terms are empty because we've selected net 30. Other payment terms will only be filled when there are other payment terms and that's only required when somebody selects um, other on the document generation form. Now, for the tasks, again, we have all of these choices. We've gone through all of them, but what I want to show you is what happens when we cancel um, or reject, reject the document and thus cancel the workflow. This agreement will not work. Okay, I can make that comment. Okay, and now we see there are no tasks to complete because we'll go ahead and go back to the legal. Now, when we go into legal department, and now we're checking out the Spalding Ridge vendor again. Now we see there's a rejected folder that's been created. And now we see that there is this document, the same one we were just looking at, status is rejected. We can click on it, we can look at, we can look at it. Um, it's rejected, attributes here show that it's rejected. There are no tasks because the workflow has ended for this document. And then the activity will not show up once workflow is um, completed as well. However, you can still go to the document history. <laughs> and so here it will show you, like I said, a far more detailed look at all of the different um, steps that have happened along this, this uh, document's life cycle. Okay. I'll close that there. Close out some of these tabs. And so that completes a standard template um, or document generation using a standard template. Now we'll take a look at document generation using a third party upload. So first of all, we're just gonna go here and we'll click the same button. And now instead of cl clicking on the standard template, we will select the third party upload. So in this, Scenario third party upload just means that the um, vendor is supplying their own, their own agreement. Now, a couple things here. First of all, the, we'll notice that the actual form fields haven't, ch um, haven't changed much. Um, and actually from the user's point of view, they haven't changed at all. So this information here will be filled out by the user again but this time it's not going to populate the contract. This information will be used for the attributes that we saw before, um, as well as to drive the workflow, but the contract itself is already created. That's, that's the idea of this third-party upload. So here we can go to our existing vendors, and for this one, we can, uh, we can just choose, let's say, We'll do true leave. So true leave will be our vendor here. We'll put this one. Let's do a new folder. So let's see our folders right now. We have legal and we have compliance, right? So if we go back here, I'm going to make this one finance. I'm going to make this one finance. We'll leave this as we'll change this as project upload is the project name and the rest of the information will just leave. Again, you can change it. 
you don't have to have it pre-populated like this, but it will make this uh, demonstration go a lot faster. So that's why I have pre-populated it. And then this required information here again, we'll say we'll leave, we'll leave these names. This will be the external signatory. I'll still be the internal signatory. Um, and we have to select the file. So here I will enter a file and save. And we've had a little error here. All right, so we had some issues with a corrupted Word doc <coughs> document there. So I had to go back and um, recreate the third party um, upload document, but we fixed that. And now I'm gonna go back and make that those information changes that I talked about. Project name will be project upload. Um, department, I'm gonna change the finance. And then um, the vendor, we will do true leave. Okay. So here, go ahead and find my file. And drag it, drop it right in there. And then everything else looks fine. And we'll go ahead and actually, you know what? I'm just going to change the city to Chicago. And we'll change the state to Illinois and we'll see why later. We can go ahead and save that. Now our document has been successfully uploaded. Then similarly, once that's done, it'll take us right back here. So first thing I wanna point out is we're in the contract repository again, and where before we just had the compliance and the legal folders, we now have the finance as well. So we saw in the legal, we had all of these different companies, I'm looking on the left side now, all these different companies within compliance, we just did Spalding Ridge. That was the first demonstration. And now within finance, we'll see that we have True Leave has been populated in there. So we'll click on this finance folder. True Leave in process. And now we have that upload going by vendor name, um, project name, and then the effective date. And now again, the big thing to point out here is as mentioned in the use case, when there is a third party upload, the contract must be routed to the, um, the sales manager before it gets routed to legal. So that's what we'll see right here. So it's pending sales manager approval. We click on this. We see that in the description. We see that as well in the attributes pending sales manager approval. I'll close that. I'll go back to our tasks tab. And right now, I don't have a task, right? Because it actually needs my sales manager's approval. So what I'm going to do now is move over to another account that I've created to act as a sales manager. Okay, so I'm gonna bring this up. And now this is another, um, another account that I have created to act as the sales manager. So if you can see up here, we see this person is called Dugard Capstone Manager, um, and they will be the manager of, of Roland Dugard that I was just acting as. So now that we have a third party upload, the first step is going to be for the sales manager to approve that. So, Sales manager will see his or her tasks. And another note here is that just like with everything else, here we have this email notification. So now this one's going to do guard capstone sales manager. And again, they will get this notification that they have, um, that they have a task. So they can click from here as well um, if they wanted to open it up. But I wanna keep my, um, my users separate right now. So I'm just gonna stay here. All right, 
So now again, I am working through as the sales manager. I can look at the attributes. I can look at the description and getting pending sales manager approval. And I can choose to, again, approve or reject this document. Now, if I reject this document, it will act the same way as if legal chooses to reject the document during their choice hub. Um, in other words, it will send the document um, to cancel or to the rejected folder that we showed you before. So if I reject here, it'll go to the rejected folder. The attributes will update to show that it has been rejected and um, it will reside in that folder. But to show you that this goes on, we're gonna go approve. And just another note here, we can go ahead and if we wanted to um, you know, check out the document and make any edits right here, we could do that. Um, same, same process as before. Okay, so comments. Looks good to me, ready for legal review. I can complete this review. And now it shows that I have no tasks as the manager. One other um, cool thing about managers that I wanna show you is this my managed users. So Roland Dugard is listed as one of my managed users. Now, if I go ahead and bring back up here, and refresh, we have the Dugard legal team, which Roland Dugard is a member of. And we have now this task, which before we have left all of these unassigned. But let's say, because we're kind of looking at these task groups as having obviously multiple people. For the sake of this demonstration, it's just me, but in real life, you might have multiple people on the legal team. Now let's say that we take this and we want to assign it um, to Roland Dugard specifically. So I would claim that task. And now it says it's assigned to me specifically within this group. Before it was, okay, anybody can go ahead and grab it. Now it's specifically been assigned to me. Now, what does that actually mean for the manager is that now when I refresh here, I'll see that, oh, okay, my managed users have a task. So now as a manager, not only do I have my own tasks as well as um, my task group, so I'm in the sales manager team, but now I can see my those who work underneath me as well, my managed users. So I can click on that and it will show me that, um, that task that my managed user has. An important part of this is that if for whatever reason my managed user is unable to complete their task, the manager can go in in lieu of them and select that task and complete it in place of um, in place of the actual person it was assigned to. So that's an important, um, an important part that we'll touch on again later. But for now, again, we have this legal decision hub and we won't go through the entire thing again. But from here, again, the, um, the description has been updated now from pending sales manager approval to pending legal approval. And same with the attribute as well, pending legal approval. In our tasks, we have those same options. Now this is a third party upload. So the difference here is that none of those fields that we saw before are going to get automatically populated. You don't have the effective date. You don't have the vendor name or the address automatically being populated. So that's going to have to be done by somebody. Now, whether that is the salesperson that uploads it who's already modified it whether that's the sales manager who's going to do their approvals and modifies it there or it's done at the legal step that is up to the to the company but that is something that will be have to be done since it is not um, being generated fully through DocuSign CLM. Okay so from here this time we're going to um, skip all of the processes that we showed before. So the redlining document, internal and vendor reviews, and we're just gonna go straight to sending for signature.
So we can show some exception paths here. I cannot type. Okay. Now, before we send it out, again, I want to take another second to look at the activity here. So it went to the sales manager first for their approval. And we see that the UR Capstone manager, the manager user that we created, approved it along with the comment. Looks good to me. Ready for legal review. All right. And now I'm at legal review. And I'm going to say we're sending it straight for signature. So we'll click next here. Okay, and now we have that chance to review it before it gets finally sent out. So here, first of all, um, again, last time we said, okay, we're gonna send for signature. I wanna show you what happens if you were to reject the request to send for signature. So let's see, we can go to the activity. We see legal reviewed it and in this case, I selected send for signature. Now keep in mind, this could have been anybody else from that legal task group. Um, and we said sending straight for signature. That's interesting. I'm taking a look at this and maybe I'm somebody else in the legal task group. And I say, this is definitely not ready for signature. So I can reject that request and I can tell them why. And reject it. Okay, and so what's going to happen here, we'll go back to our tasks, and now it just bounces right back to that hub. So now again, the legal team, anybody in the legal team has the option to click on this, and now they can reevaluate and say, okay, what do we want to do? And we see, okay, somebody said, did not choose to send it for signature and said it's definitely not ready. So from here, maybe we might want to redline the document or send it for additional internal review or vendor review before it gets sent out for signature. Um, again, we're gonna send it for signature again, just so that we can show you another exception path. Okay, so this time it's ready. We'll go next. We'll wait for this to load. Close some tabs. All right, so now we're back to our tasks tab and we can review and send for signature. Now we could choose to reject that request again, or in this case, to show you what happens, we're gonna send for signature. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. So now again, we have that um, the signer is automatically pulled from that document generation form. So that's why it's important to have that document generation form, even though it's a third party up upload, um, we still are capturing relevant information that although it may not be thrown directly onto or into the contract, it still ends up being used to drive the workflow in places like this where we have these automatically populated with um, the signers' names and their email addresses. Again, you have the uh, ability to switch the order. You have the ability to add recipients, um, change the requirements for those recipients, um, and, uh, oh, and then change the email as well. 
So now before I said Swalding Ridge, you guys can see this, this subject line has automatically updated to Truly, the new company that we are working with. And then again, adding additional documents if that's necessary. So we'll click next here. And so one main difference between um, the third party upload and the, um, the contracts generated from a template in, in, uh, doc, in the document generator or in CLM are that those tags that we saw before are not going to be automatically placed. So actually, and I'm just realizing I copied over, when I copied over this new document, um, I did copy these over. So actually what we'll see is that um, these, these tags will typically not be automatically placed. Um, however, and I'll show you why that is, but the way that you would place in new, new tags is just from the left bar here. So you would pull these in, you can place them wherever they need to be, um, change any settings that you want to. And um, from there, that will automatically direct the signers to these locations. So the rest of the process here stays the same. And I will show you the difference. The reason that these are populating here now is because when I had that issue earlier with the corrupted file, um, and was unable to upload it. I just copied, um, I copied an old version and put it into a new Word document so that I would be able to use it in this recording. Unfortunately, I forgot that my sign tags were actually still in here. Um, and I'll show you how that mistake can happen because they are actually written in white, so I didn't see them. And um, so typically, a third party upload would not have any of those sign tags. And so they would not be able to place these here automatically. And so someone would have to come in manually and do that. But since I forgot to delete them for this third party upload, they're already here, but that's just something to keep note of. You can go through with sending. And just like before, that will be sent out to the external signees or the external and internal signees, the external first, and they will have an opportunity to um, sign or reject that document. So since we signed it last time, I'm going to show you what happens um, when it is rejected. And so we'll just give it a second here for that email to show up. Okay, so now Katie Weeks again, she gets the email first and it shows that she has this um, document to sign. So we review that document. And let's say she looks at this and she says, wait a minute, this is totally missing information. I'm not signing this. How did it get through all these approvals? and?" They're asking me to sign. So she might say here, other actions um, and decline to sign. I'll ask you if you're sure. And the reasoning here we're gonna put in is the contract is incomplete. So now our external signer has declined to sign. <coughs> Okay, so now after declining to sign, first of all, that, that person, Katie Weeks, who was offered to sign, will get an email confirming that they have declined the signature. Secondly, um, the internal user that sent it out for signature will also get an email saying that Katie Weeks has declined to sign the signature or to sign the document, and it will give the reasons that she gave in her comments. The contract is incomplete. So what actually happens with the workflow when this happens? So coming back over here, we'll see that now all of a sudden we have this legal decision hub has popped back up. 
So we can click on that. And now here we go. We have all these choices again. Um, we had originally just sent it for signature and it bounced back because it was declined. And now that will happen with either of the signatories. So if the external signer declines, um, it will bounce back to this choice hub for the legal team, as well as if this, um, the secondary signer, the internal signer declines, the same thing will happen. Okay. Okay, so with that, we have pretty much gone through all of the workflow as it would be viewed from the typical end user. Now, I want to go ahead and show you uh, the process and all the things that perhaps an administrator would need to know when looking at this system. Kind of the back end workings or how does this all work, right? How is this built? So, first off, we will talk about the, um, the document generation. So from this navigation bar up here, we're going to go to admin. And on the left-hand side under automation tools, we'll look at document generation. Now here, we'll click on our forms. And then we'll scroll down here. And I have two, do guard capstone and um, do guard capstone third party upload. Now, first I'll walk you through do guard capstone, which this form is what is used for the standard template. Now, as you probably are realizing, these are um, very familiar fields, right? We've seen these already on the document generation. This is where it's actually built. Now, here we have all of the different fields. When you click on it, for example, date, it'll let you select the field name. Um, it'll let you select the default value. So that's what I did for a lot of these to streamline the demonstration process. However, if you wanted to, you could also choose to leave it blank or choose a specific date. You can also choose the format in which the date will be, um, will be displayed in the Microsoft Word, in Microsoft Word based on your preferences. And then lastly here, we have um, conditions as well as different settings. So you can hide from the user, require user input, or allow the, edit to, um, allow the user to edit the field value. So these are all decisions that you will have to make on a, you will likely make on a case-by-case -case basis. So let's say, for example, we don't want the contract amount um, to be something that a, uh, or to be something that's pre-populated, right? So we can go ahead and delete this. And let's say we will require user input and we will not. Another thing I wanna point out here is the conditional fields. So for example, here we have payment terms and in our options, we have these five options. Now, we were able to set a default net 30, and that's done by clicking this box here. Also for additional or for other, we have additional info required. So from there, I created another text field and here I'm able to make it such that this field only appears if someone selects other. So that would be in edit conditions. So here we can select that. We read this out like a sentence. So merge this field into the template if all of the following conditions are met. So you could add you know, multiple conditions if you wanted to. Right now we just have one. We want that field to come in if the payment terms equal other. So you would come here. You can see all your different fields. Right now um, we know that we are in uh, contract information and the contract information field that we're talking about is payment terms. So we'll click payment terms. Oh, and it's already selected. So it's not going to let me apply it again, but we can close that. And then is equal to, you have other choices. It's not equal to, has a value. 
blah, blah, blah. All of these does not have a value. And then now it shows all of the options for that actual field. So net 30, net 45, net 60, net 90, other additional require or other additional info, info required. So now merge this field into the template if payment terms is equal to other additional info required. So that's how that reads. And you, like I said, you can add multiple fields um, or multiple conditions. So that's one example of that. Another one here is the existing vendor or new vendor. So depending on which of these radio buttons is selected, um, they will either have the option to put in a existing vendor or a new vendor. Address information, signatory um, information here. And now one last thing that I wanna point out is this hidden field. So if you click on this, we have a um, just a checkbox that says standard template. So this is asking, is this, this is a way for the system to know if this form belongs to a standard template or not. And I'll show you why that's important later. So here we checked it because it is a standard template. And here in our, um, our form for the third party upload, which by the way, looks almost identical or it is identical except for one thing. At the bottom here, this standard template, we leave it unchecked. Now, the user, like we said, this is hidden from the user, so they're not going to see it either way. This is going to be used to tell the system um, whether or not uh, this, this document is a third-party upload. So I'll close that, I'll go back here, and these are the type of fields as well that you can use. So here we have, for example, effective date would be a date field, um, contract amount would be a currency field. Uh, a lot of these are just normally text fields. And then one thing that I want to note is there's these library fields. So what library fields are, are that in your form, under forms libraries, so we're back here under automation tools, document generation, forms libraries, you can actually basically create a form. So let's say um, I see contract information, this whole section here. And I know that I'm going to use it on multiple forms. Instead of creating it on each form individually, like I've done between my tip of my, my uh, standard template form and my uh, third party upload form, I could instead have created this section or this entire template outside of, um, outside of this last checkbox, could have created those in forms libraries. And so those will be built the same way as a typical form, except then when you're in the form, you can select library field and it will let you select that entire, um, that entire form library. So that's another option, especially if you know that you will be, um, that you will be utilizing the same types of fields a bunch of um, many times over. I'm going to discard those changes, go back to my document generation. And then, well, one last thing that I do want to show about these forms um, is the merge tags. So here we have all the fields. And then on the other tab here, we have the merge tags. So what these are, are, are the tags that show the machine, okay, how or where do I put this information into the actual um, template? So here we have effective date. Here, the merge tag would be right here, and that's what you would paste into the document. So all of these the ones that go into the document are pasted into the document before it goes to document generation. And so I'll show you how that's done as well. Okay, so now coming back to our main capstone folder, we can go to admin, and now we'll take a look at our merge templates. So this is our merge template for the master services agreement. And if we click on it, you'll actually see those merge tags that we're talking about.
Okay. So right here we have the project name. And then we have master services agreement for XYZ Corp. And now we have another merge tag, vendor name. And now we have XYZ Corp approver. That's the XYZ signatory name. So coming back over here, okay. XYZ signatory name, looking at the merge tag, XYZ signatory name. So we just literally copy that tag and then we go over here and paste it in. So that's done for all of this information too. So we see here the effective date, uh, the vendor name again, the, uh, the actual address. So we have the street, city, state, zip are all inserted into this, um, into this merge template. And then lastly at the bottom here, again, we have the vendor name is ins inserted here. And so it looks really messy right now, but once the machine goes through, the system um, populates all of those merge tags from the form, then you have that information replacing the merge tags. So that's how that works. Okay. So that covers the forms. Now, while we are in this admin folder, I also want to show you how we were able to update the names of existing vendors. So workflow, and this is our contract management workflow. And here I have CSV mapping files. So here we have the DuGuard Capstone approved vendor list information. So what this is, is a spreadsheet of all of the vendors that we have on the form. So in the document generation form, I'll pull that up again. So these existing vendors all live within this CSV. When we have a new vendor and end it, enter it here, when this document goes through the workflow, what the system does is automatically updates this CSV. And so that the next time you come in through here, you see that new vendor that you inserted as an existing vendor because it lives in that updated CSV file. Now, alternatively, if you wanted to just change the, um, if you just wanted to change the existing vendors here without having to add them as a new vendor first, an administrator would be able to come in here and actually download this Download this and replace this company. So here are all the ones that have been added as new vendors. And we weren't adding new vendor information. That's something you could do as well and have that update as well. But for the sake of, um, of this demonstration, we were just focusing on updating the vendor name. And so these are new ones that were added through new vendor. But let's say that I actually just wanted to add one in here. Um, let's say DocuSign. If I just wanted to add in DocuSign, oops. I could do that here. I'd be able to save this document. Well, let's see, I'm not gonna actually do it. Uh, I'd be able to save that document. I could um, check in that document here again. Oh, and of course we wanna check out first, but I could check in that document again here. And then the next time that I go to this form, it will just show me those companies that I've added as existing vendors. So there's two ways. To, to do that, either automatically through the new vendor or um, as an existing vendor. And again, here's that example of those conditional fields that we saw on the forms, right? Based on what I select, a different field is going to show up. And just like here, based on what I select, this additional box might show up. Okay.
Okay, so now that we've shown you the CSV mapping and how that's automatically updated, we will go to the attributes. But first, before we do that, I do want to show you the eSign tags, um, which are can kind of be looked at as as template or um, as as merge tags. So coming back here to our admin again. I will just, uh, I'll take our merge template and I'll download it just to show you. Wow, the same error again. Okay, well, at least this downloaded. So here's our merge, our merge tag, our merge template again, wow. Here's our merge template again. And so we see the merge tags. And the reason that I uh, had that issue earlier is because although you can't see them here, if I highlight everything, I'm just gonna make the, um, the background black here. We actually have these signature tags put in here. So earlier when I was doing a third party upload, for whatever reason, my document was corrupted and I had to copy, I just copied over um, an old version of this that had not had been merge tagged yet and put it into um, a new Word document so that I could demonstrate the third party upload. However, I forgot that these invisible um, e-signature tags were here. And so the way that we do this is we put, we put in these e-signature tags and this tells e-signature where to put those boxes that we saw before. So this actually tells it, okay, this is where I'm gonna put that signature box. This is where I'm gonna put that name box. Here's where I'm gonna put the title box. And within eSignature, that's where you can select what type of signature it is. So, or what type of field it is. So if it's a signature, if it's um, a title, if it's optional or if it's required, um, the date signed right here. So all those things, were within that document that I was trying to show as a third party upload. So that's when we uh, when we went to the e-sign that it was actually already showing those tags there. However, for the most part, when you get a third party upload, they will not come with these tags already. So when you go to the send for signature step and you are in the e-signature, you will have to manually drag those those um, fields onto here so that people can sign or date or whatever it may be on the document. Those would not typically be auto-populated. Okay, so I'm not sure what happened here. Let me just close that. And so now um, I'm going to show you the attributes real quick before we dive into the actual workflow. And then, so the attributes, here and my attributes are down here. And you can create um, a number of attribute groups and use them for different purposes. For this one, I knew that this was going to be the attributes that I wanted to be included for my contracts that I'm generating. So that's why I named it as such. However, you could have different attributes for different reasons, whether it be for different types of documents, um, whether it's for you know, folders or, or other things. And, or you could even apply multiple attribute groups um, to, a doc, to, a, to a document. And so here, you're all grouped up and these are all of those attributes that we see when we're looking at a document. So we have the attributes right here, And I believe I misspoke earlier, but here is where you will decide um, required or read only for those attributes. So right here, and you'll see those same attributes um, when you look at a document. So for example, contracts that then there are different types, date string, all um, drop down, all of that. So here you are able to, you are not able to edit the attribute uh, type once it's been used on a document. 
However, um, so that's just something to be um, aware of. And then if you were to add multiple, you can continue to add attributes here. Um, you would just have to update that in your workflow. Okay, so that's, that's just a quick overview of the attributes. And now we're gonna go into the actual workflow here. So from here, from the navigation tab, the, well, I'll just stay here. So from the navigation tab, we'll go to admin again. And now we're going under automation tools, we're going to select uh, workflows. Here it's going to show us our workflow activity first. So different workflows that have been um, run recently. Maybe not. There you go. Here we go. So now it shows. So I've been the one that's been running this through Guard Capstone a bunch. Um, there are other people on this um, on this account, this Spalding Ridge account, and they have also been working on their capstones actually. So you can see at a high level here all the different workflows that are happening um, within your account. And so focusing on the ones that I've been running. We have this one that's still executing. We have one that's been aborted and we have um, several that have been completed. Okay, so going into the actual configuration now, I'll select my capstone. And I'll walk you through some of the steps that I chose and kind of why I chose them. Okay, so at a high level first, we start off with document generation. So that happens in this first box. Um, and so what these are called are swim lanes actually. So this gray box, this blue, purple, um, teal, these are all called swim lanes. And what they're used as, they're used as a way to better organize your workflow so that you can better visualize it either um, by, by stage in the contract lifecycle or by user. Um, there are a couple of common ways to organize them, but again, it's more to help um, long-term maintenance of this workflow be easier, no matter who is working on it. So it's not just the original person that built this that understands it so that anyone can easily understand it. So this first one, we have document generation and folder creation. Next, we either go down to sales manager approval, if it's a third party, or directly to legal review. From legal review, you can see that legal acts as a hub here, and we have additional internal reviews. In orange, we have the vendor, um, the vendor review. Red here is the rejection path. And then down here is the e-signature. So starting from the top, we start out by um, initializing our variables that will be used in the, um, in the, in the workflow. And then we go to, um, renaming the document is the first big one, I would say. So here we're renaming the document in the same way that we just saw here, vendor name underscore, oops, vendor name underscore effective, um, effective date. And I actually haven't changed that, but I have changed the expression. So it's vendor name underscore project name, and this right, what I'm updating right now is just the description. So this doesn't actually affect the workflow at all. This is just the description that we see when we're looking at the workflow so that we can look, glance at something and not have to, you know, read the actual expression here, but just look at it and know, oh, okay, this is what's going on at that step. So here at this step, we rename it. The way we do this is we select the document, which is params here. That's our, um, our contract. And then the expression here says we're going to get variable. So we initialize the variables vendor name. Um, and then we'll add an underscore, get variable again from params. Params it shows the path here from your template, from your template, getting the project name underscore. And then again from your template, getting the effective date and then adding dot doc x. And so that will be the new. Um, the new document name for each document. From here, we create our folder structure. 
So again, we go back to documents and we see, okay, it goes DuGuard Capstone and then we have admin, we have contract repository. Um, and in that contract repository, we have, so we have contract repository, then we have department names. From the department names, if we click into the legal department, now we have all the different vendor names, right? And then within the vendor names, we have in process, we have completed, and then in some cases we have rejected as well. So how do we create that? Uh, back over here. So first we will create the department folder. Um, from there, we go ahead and create the vendor folder and its parent folder will be that department folder. From there, we create the um, in process folder and that its parent will be that vendor folder like we just saw. And then the last step here is to actually move the document um, into the in-process folder because that's where we're starting. So we move that document into the in-process folder. From here, we go on and apply our attributes. So to do that, first we have to create variables. So here we create variables for each of the different fields that we're going to want to use. So the, these are the different fields um, and the variables here, we see that they're created here create variable, and then you can select the variable name, description, and um, type of variable that it is. So we've created these variables, and what we did with each one of these for the variable value is directed the system to show it, okay, here's where on the form that you're going to pull that information from. And you'll put it in this variable called expiration date. We'll do the same thing for vendor street, vendor city, all the way down. And so now we have all of these variables within our workflow that have been populated by information from the, from the um, document generation template. From there, we can actually update our attributes. So before this step, if you were to look at a document and try to look at its attributes, they would be all empty. They would be all empty before that step, before this step. At this step, what we're doing is taking the variables, which are filled with information from the template that was just filled out by a user and putting that information now into the attributes. So vendor name, vendor street, all the way down. Department, the same. So that's how that information is populated within the document now. And you'll see, we specified the document as well. So we specified the document params. You'll see these throughout, but the update document keywords and update document metadata value are what we use to update those descriptions um, and then the, the status attribute at each step. So that's why you see in process. That's why you see pending legal review. Um, that's why you see all of the pending signature, all of those things. So that's how those are updated. One other thing before we move on here is the actual decision step. So here we have a decision step to figure out if it was a new user uh, or a new vendor or an existing vendor. And that's set through a condition. So here I have one of my, um, one of my variables is set to the form where you either select one of those buttons. You select either new vendor or existing vendor. And what I'm saying here is if that variable, if it equals new vendor, then the output will be update the CSV list. Okay. And then if not, it'll just do nothing. So here, update the CSV list if, if that condition is met, and then it will find the document. So here I've set a variable to, for the path to that, um, that CSV that we looked at. And um, once we locate that document, we will take the new, the new vendor, and this is just some C-sharp code here. We'll move to a new line, and we'll put that vendor name into that, into that new cell, or into that new line. 
So that's what this is doing. And again, it only happens if this decision step um, is able to analyze and say that this condition that the vendor that the vendor type is new vendor. If that happens and it goes here, otherwise it just continues on this path. Here we find submitted by's manager variable um, or initialize it, excuse me. So here what we're doing is taking, okay, the person who submitted it, so that would be me in this case, who is their manager? And I'll show you how a manager is set, but what this does is find that manager. And we know that my manager was Dugard Capstone Manager. And now it stores that manager in a variable so that they can be used later down the line. Primarily, they will be used here at this first approval step, the sales manager approval, where that actual step will be assigned to that variable manager of submitted by. Now going back over here though, after finding the user, we have a decision step. We have to decide whether or not it's a third party upload. So that's where we have the standard template checkbox that we had before, right? So now I've created a variable for that standard template checkbox. And I have um, inserted the value for it as um, whether or not that checkbox is checked. And so if it's checked, that's, um, that is read as true by the system. And so if it is a standard template, then we will want to send it directly to legal. If it's not, so otherwise, we want to send it for um, third, for, uh, we want to send it for the sales manager approval. So that's how that decision is made. From here, the sales manager will approve and then send it to legal, or it will go straight to legal. Uh, or then it will go straight to legal here. So the way these approvals work is that first of all, we have the step description, right? And the step description is showing what you will see um, as an administrator back here to show you what the step does. However, the display name will show you what happens. Um, the display name will show you what, when you're in your tasks, that's what's shown to the user. So the user will see the display name here, sales manager approval, and that's what they click on when they want to do their tasks. Um, if you don't put a display name, it will just show approve one. So when somebody, you know, goes to their tasks, instead of saying um, sales manager approval, or instead of seeing legal decision hub, instead of seeing legal decision hub here, they would just see choice one. So that's why we rename it. And then the stage name is used um, for reporting, which we'll get to next. Okay, and then from here, Yes, it does this approval. It goes down to the legal choice hub, where again, here they have all of these different options. The same ones that we see and that we saw a bunch of times. Here, we see the way that those actually look in the workflow. So, let me close this so we can see more. Well, these two, again, we're updating the status. So now it's pending legal approval before it gets here. Now, the choices that they have were to redline the document, in which case it'll just go out to this edit document step and then come back to the hub. They can send it for additional reviews, which they will first choose the users, which we did. It will update the status. That user will have the approval task and then it will be sent back to the um, to the legal choice hub now with an updated status again that that review is complete. Likewise, if they were to send it to vendor to a vendor for review, it would go down and be sent to the vendor to review and send for vendor. Um, they'll wait for that review. Once it's done, it will go back um, and with an updated status again. Over here, we, we see that if either the legal or the sales manager decides to reject the document, it will go into this rejected swim lane where again, the status is updated. And now we'll see a new folder is created here 
folder name is rejected and its parent folder is also going to be the vendor folder, just like in, pro um, in process. And then we will move the document into that rejected folder and that ends the workflow. So that's one way of ending the workflow. And now lastly, we have um, sending for signature. Before I go to sending for signature, I do wanna talk about the task assignment real quick. So task assignment, the biggest example here is definitely the legal choice hub. So they have the most tasks. And what we've done here is you can either assign to a user or you can assign to a task group. Now for management purposes, a task group is favorable because it allows multiple people to um, be able to send something for or be able to approve something so that it's less likely to get hung up um, in the workflow. So here, what we've done is selected a task group and we've selected the legal team. Now, if we go over to admin and we go to task groups, we'll see that my legal team just has me. So that's why when we were going through these different tasks, I'll duplicate this tab. When you're going through these tasks for a legal team, I'm the only person here. However, um, realistically, there could be multiple, multiple, multiple people all here, and they could all be, um, be able to claim this task. And so within your workflow, you can decide, okay, who needs to respond? Um, all of the assignees or just any one of them. And then similarly for approvals, if you were to, if you were to send it to a, a task group, you can also decide whether every single person in that group has to approve it or if, um, just one person from that group has to approve it in order for it to move on. Okay. Now, if the legal team chooses to send it for signature, I'll go down this path here. And this is where they have the chance to review it first. And that's where you get the option to send for signature or, or reject sending it for signature. So if it's rejected sending for signature, it will bounce right back to that hub. If it's not, it'll go ahead, update the status again, and then it will wait for a signature. Now, if it times out, it'll go back to that review step. So the person, um, the legal team, this is assigned to the legal team. Will or this is, yes, this is assigned to the legal team. Um, and it will be here, um, assigned to the legal team. And they will be notified that this is timed out, they have a new task, um, and then they can send it out again, or they can just reject it and go back here and reevaluate. Now, the other options here are that if it's signed, first of all, we will send the signed agreement to the sales manager, which we showed on the first, um, first demonstration. So not only do the two signers get an email with the document, the, um, the sales manager gets an email as well. Then we update the status again, and now we're going to create a completed folder. And then we will um, move the contract into that completed folder. And that's the other way that this workflow can finish. Now, the one step, the one path that I didn't talk about yet is this one unlabeled is when we are waiting for the signature, there are a lot of different outputs for this, for this step. So the way that we have it now is that if it times out, it will go back to review and send for signature. If it is signed, it will go into that, it will notify the sales manager and then complete um, its move into the, um, into the completed folder. So those are the actions that will be triggered. And then um, if not, if neither of those things, so if it's rejected, um, if it's rejected, canceled, uh, or if there's a failure, then we have this where the, um, the signature status will be updated based on which one of those happens. So if it's rejected, we'll return rejected. If it's canceled, we'll say signature is canceled and so on and so forth. We store that in a variable called signature status. 
And then we take that st status variable and put it into the status attribute. So whatever happens out of here, it'll either go and finish normally, it'll return through a timeout, or any other, any other outcome, it will be sent back to the choice hub and they will know exactly why, because the status will be updated. So it's not just like it's coming back and they're not sure if it was um, you know, rejected here or if it came back for another reason, they'll know exactly why, because that contact status is updated with the signature output XML. Okay. Okay. Now that pretty much covers the workflow at a high level. Obviously it can get a lot more granular, but that is the workflow at a high level. Now I would like to talk about user management a little bit more. Um, I'll just go ahead and close that. Close that. And now if we were go to go back to, now we're back in admin again, um, we showed you the task groups here, but we can also show you users. So if you wanted to create a new user, so for example, when I was creating my manager, you would just click here. And then here you would have to select a unique login name. Um, you can select their permissions here. I am currently acting as a super administrator. And then you would also be able, and you also have to enter at least their last name and an email address. And from there, they will get um, an activation email to set up their account. So that's exactly what I did. So if we search, search do guard here, I have my actual work account as well as the account that I just created for um, my manager, which I just used my email address plus Dugard Capstone sales manager. Now, how did I make them my manager? If I click up here on the top right and I go to my preferences, and I click on my profile, we see managed by right here. So here's where you can select who your manager is. So I created that other user and then I selected that user as my managed by value. And that is why when we went earlier and signed in as this user, that's why that user was able to see my tasks, my assigned tasks as, um, as they as are on their tasks page. That's why they were able to do that. Okay. We'll go back to admin. Okay, I believe that covers user creation. We talked about the different groups. Uh, if I go back to groups here, or task groups, excuse me. You can also use groups to set security as well. So when we look at our, um, at our folders, you can decide based on different groups of users who will be able to view different folders who will be able to edit um, folders, delete documents, all of those things can be set based on, um, on user groups and, and then and folders. So here we have my two teams that I created. For example, the sales manager team we'll take a look at now. Okay, so this one has both me, my normal account, as well as the created account as my manager here. So that's why they're both in this group um, he's my manager as well. So even if um, I wasn't assigned a specific task, if it were a task that's assigned to the sales manager team, um, we would both be able to grab that task. That's how that works. Okay. Now moving on to um, reports. So here I've created three main reports. Um, from the use case, they say XYZ Corp must be able to report on how long it takes for the contract review workflow to be completed. On average, they must also be able to report on the contracts currently under review, as well as the stage in the review process for each of the contracts. In addition, XYZ Corp will need to report on various attribute fields assigned to each contract. Okay, 
So first, we'll take a look at this first one, full completion time. Um, how long does it take for these workflows to be completed on average? Okay, so here we have workflow name, vendor name, um, sorry date, but most importantly, we have the duration. So here we can see that, okay, there's various different durations, ones that we clicked through super quickly, ones that I've had open for a day. Um, and so in the real world, you would obviously be able to see the difference between um, maybe you have certain vendors that take longer, or maybe you have certain workflow styles that take longer. Um, also, we'll show you the status here. They're all completed, obviously, because we're, we're, that's what we're um, organized by, the, um, the status complete. So how long did it take to get there? Okay, for the next report, we will show the attributes. So this is just kind of an overview report. Where we selected some attributes that we want to display um, in aggregate. So here again, we can see the document name. We can organize it by most recently modified if we'd like to. And then here we have um, attributes from that attribute group that we that we looked at earlier. So from here, I could edit it. And here we have some filters like. Since I'm in a shared environment, I only want things created by myself. Um, if I want to modify the columns, we can select different columns that we want to see in that report. So these are the ones that I've selected, and these are specifically from my attribute group. You can see it grayed out here. So those are all included here. I'm going to cancel this. And we'll go back to the reports and look at the third and final report here, which is um, organizing by contract status. All right. So here now we've shown our contracts um, by again those those contract status attribute that we that we looked at earlier. So now they're grouped by that. Now, some of them have none here. So these are from my workflow from before I had updated that status. So you don't lose all of your contracts. Um, these are the ones that I created since, and these were the ones since before that. So they don't have that status attribute. So if we were to look at in process, we'd see here we have one in process still. And then it will give us some information here. It'll be blank where it's not filled in. If we look at these, again, same thing. We have the internal owner name, email, created date. Um, but most importantly, what we're trying to look at at a high level here is, oh, okay, where are these? And going back now to our dashboard, That's the report that we're showing right here. And I'll give it a second to update. So that's it for reports. Again, you can edit, those are all editable. So I'll close that out. And now, so that report is shown here, but now we're back to our dashboard and I said I'd show you this. So here, now that we are familiar with some of these things, we see that our tasks are here. Um, so it's a quick view of them. We can see my recently updated documents or access documents, excuse me. And then as well as the folder structure that I'm working out of. So you could set that however you want. Um, to, if I wanted to make this specifically just show me my contract repository, I could do that. And then we have our contract status. So I selected the report that I wanted to show, and then I decided that, okay, I want it to be, I checked, I selected this report, and then I said, okay, I want it as a bar chart. Um, alternatively, you could obviously do it as a donut chart if you wanted. So I say, save that. Okay, now we can see 
here's the different um, projects, and then here's like the stage that they are in. So you have that ability. If you want to add something, these are the different kinds of widgets that there are, and it's quite easy as, um, as drag and drop. So you could just drag something in, drop it there, and then you have a new widget. So that's how, that's how easy it is. And same thing with rearranging them is um, it is just drag and drop. So you could put them wherever you want. Move these up. Okay, I'm gonna put this here. Yeah, so you can just drag and drop, easily editable. And what this is meant to be is just a high level view of what's going on in your, in your environment. Okay, so we've talked about user management. Um, we've talked about the workflow and reporting on and reporting on it as well as the documents. And we've talked about updating this solution post go live. Um, just a little bit more on that. Again, all of those updating things for an administrator are going to be coming out of this admin tab up here. Uh, the workflow can be changed like we just saw. That's probably going to be the most um, in-depth way of changing that. We went over document generation. E-forms can be used to, um, to send those notification emails. However, if we, oh, you know what? I don't have it up. I'll pull up my workflow again. So currently we have our notification emails. For example, when um, a document comes to the legal hub, we have an email like this that says, contract for vendor name requires your attention. Please check your tasks tab in DocuSign CLM or click below to view and complete your assigned task. And then they have that button below it. So that is one way to do it. And then same thing for the email subject here. A different way to do it would be through creating an e-form. Um, and you can go ahead and create the actual um, email subject line and email body so that it would be uh, easier to edit from, out, from outside of the workflow if you don't want to go into the workflow to edit things. Um, and see what else did we go over here? We went over the attributes, um, as well as user management, account management. And now we will want to talk about kind of how do we get, how do we take this um, solution from this uh, testing environment to production? So again, we are in admin. If we were to go down to account management and then deployment, All right, so it's finally loaded. Again, we are in um, account management deployment. And here is where you will be able to create a deployment package. So the first thing here is you'll want to definitely create a new name um, that is imperative. Uh, we're not actually going to deploy this right now, but I will walk through all of the steps to do so. So we'll create a new name here, a description if you desire, and then you have some options here, auto install, overwrite existing objects, include account settings, include account branding, uh, include account level customization of navigation tabs, menus, and toolbars. Um, obviously this can change on a case by case basis, but typically best practice um, leads you into these three middle check boxes. From here, you're going to go through these tabs and select what you actually want to bring over to the new production environment. So for me, if I were selecting a folder, I would go and I wanna just bring mine, I would grab DuGuard Capstone, I would select that, and that would be the folder that I want to, that I wanna bring in. And it will give me the option, do I wanna include the documents um, or do I wanna include group security, all of those things. Similarly, you can go to attribute groups. And if I were moving just my environment, I would go down and I would find Dugard Capstone, click select, 
Um, e forms would be here. User groups would be here. Um, smart rules, reports. If I wanted to bring um, over, yeah, any of my reports, I could select those here. Workflows, super important. Um, I'd want to grab my Dugard Capstone workflow. Task groups, go through and I find, okay, my two task groups that I created. And then so on and so forth. Oh, and document generation configuration. So before I forget, um, I will I will come back to show that really quickly before we wrap this up because I think I did not show the document generation configuration. So you would select all the things that you want to include in your um, in your package, and then from there you would choose where is this package going to go within the current environment. Right now we have a folder called All Access. You would save this here you will get an email um, letting you know that it's processing and you'll get an email when it is, um, when it's, when it is completed, when the package has been um, created. From there, you will find that package in the all access folder. So, oh, okay. We'll just open up a new one, that's fine. So here we have users. In this all access folder. So this is where you would find that package it would be in this all access. And so here you can see a bunch of different packages um, from different users in this space. And then from there, you would actually go and let's say you see one of these package, you could download it, you would download that package. And then once you get to the new environment, you would be able to open up that package, um, click into it, and it will give you the option to install that package. And that is how you would um, promote this solution into another environment. Now, one thing that I did not mention earlier that I want to just show really quickly is the document generation configuration. So back to automation tools and document generation here, Okay, so here we took a look at the forms before, and so those were the actual document generation forms. But now let's take a look at the actual configuration. So when I go down and I find my capstone configuration, oh, let's see if I can find it. Oh, do guard capstone. So when I select that, I'll give it a second to load. And now we see that it has two templates. So just like when we click on the action and go down to generate contract, we see third-party upload and standard template. Now we're updating this in the future. The way that this happens is so for the third-party upload, there's not much here. All they need to know is what form configuration file are you using? So we select that file that we showed um, before, that form file, which again, is the same as the other form, except for the fact that it doesn't have that checkbox checked at the bottom. So we're going to use that. Now for the standard template, we choose the name standard template. And it asks, okay, what form configuration file do you want to use for this one? And we're going to use the regular DuGuard capstone, um, not the third party upload one, which again is the same, except it just does it just has that checkbox checked. But it also is going to ask the second question, um, what is the template file that you're using? And that's where we put that merge template file um, with all of the merge tags. So this is basically pairing together the actual form um, that you're entering in, uh, data into and then the template where that data will be merged. Um, from here, where we'll use this configuration. So without the workflow steps that actually start creating other folders and 
moving the document around, um, this is where this is where the generated documents will start. So they'll start in the contract repository, and then the workflow automatically moves them into the other folders. But if you didn't have the workflow, if um, if for example you weren't launching workflow, so right now we're launching this workflow, do guard capstone. If we weren't, then those configurations would just go straight, or sorry, that um, those generated documents would just go straight into that contract repository folder and sit there indefinitely until someone um, manually moves them or, um, or otherwise. And then you can run in debug mode if you would like to, that allows you to generate the, um, the raw XML from the contract generation in case you need to figure out, okay, if, if there are bugs happening. All right. With that, I do believe I have walked through the dashboard. We looked at the documents and the folder structure. Um, obviously, we did a bunch of tasks. We looked at the three reports. And, um, and then we went over the actual administration side of things and how everything works from the back end and how you might go about changing things um, for future iterations. Um, yeah, so I think that covers everything. Um, one, oh, one last thing that I will show is the navigation in action. So if we go to navigation and actions here on the left, this is where we actually can um, not only modify this navigation bar, but uh, more importantly, we can create buttons, action buttons to uh, kick off our workflows. So I'll go to actions menu here. And here's where we can select um, an action. So to give you an example, I'll click new action here. Call that capstone. Um, could add a description if we wanted to. And what should this action do? In our case, uh, we were opening document generation because our document generation uh, kicks off the workflow. So here we would select, um, we'll just say any one right now because we're not going to uh, actually use this. And then right now we have it in a new window tab. And then you can just select an icon. Um, all right, and then pass user information. So we'll save that. And now we have a new button. However, if we go up here, it's not going to show up. We're not going to see uh, just a capstone button here. What we have to do is go back to our actions menu. There we go. Find that button that we just created. Capstone. And then from here, we would have to actually enable it by hitting the slider. And we'll see instead of being fully grayed out now, it's just gray. <laughs> and so from the actions now, uh, we would be able to see our, uh, we'll probably have to refresh this page. Yes, and now we'll be able to see our capstone button here at the bottom. And since we're not actually using that for anything, I'm gonna go ahead, go back to that capstone button um, you could either deactivate it, or for me, I'm just going to go ahead and delete that action. Okay. Now, I believe we have covered everything listed in the requirements for this DocuSign CLM accreditation program. Of course, if I have missed anything, um, please let me know. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to this uh, presentation. I know it was long. I was trying to cover everything. So um, thank you for your time and I look forward to the feedback.